Tuesday. We watched a little bit of a video about the containment. Also discussed different protocols uh, in terms of the microbial control, right? Uh, we discussed three protocols that can be applied for microbial control on inanimate surfaces. The most rigorous sterilization that destroys all the life, then um, disinfection that is a little bit uh, more lax, and finally sanitization. And we talked about two techniques that are used on the patients. In dysepsis, when you kill microbes using chemicals such as iodine, and dermation, you mechanically remove microbial load from the patient's skin, okay, or your own skin. Next, we're going to talk about general points of consideration for microbial control and different methods. And we will see whether these methods are uh, disinfecting or sanitizing or sterilizing. So what are the most important factors that we have to take into account when we consider what to use for control of microbes? First and foremost, the nature of microbes. This lineup represents the microbial, different microbial forms growing, going from the most to least resistant. Bacterial endospores are really hard to kill. Microbes like Clostridium difficile that cause frequent hospital acquired infections, right? They are spore formers. So once you have patients with C. diff, the hospital will permanently be contaminated by bacterial endospores. You cannot possibly sterilize the entire hospital building. Well, unless you want all the patients to become patients of the morgue, not the hospital. Uh, pre so endospores are notoriously resistant. So are prions. Who heard about prions? Prions are infectious proteins. Okay, we 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 will talk about them. Don't worry. Uh, so far, what I want you to understand, they are not even living organisms. They just proteins. And I bet you have heard about the diseases that prions cause: Metcalf disease in cattle, Creutzfeldt Jakob's disease in humans, chronic wasting disease in deer, that is actually quite endemic in Minnesota and uh, Wisconsin. Not sure about Michigan. So pretty much north Midwest. Now prions can withstand boiling, UV light exposure, most of the chemicals, even the most aggressive chemicals. Um, there was a case in one of the Texas hospitals, and the patient who underwent surgery later was diagnosed, like later, almost right after the surgery, was diagnosed with Creutzfeldt Jacobs disease. So his blood that was on the table and instruments and everything else was essentially carrying those prion proteins. And this hospital equipment had to be decontaminated. After thorough assessment, hospital got rid of everything in that room, like everything in the hospital room, in the surg surgical suite. So they lost tens of thousands of dollars on that one patient because, because they could not possibly clean it up in a proper way. Next, after the bacterial endospores and prions, we talk protozoan cysts, sexual spores of fungi, naked viruses, and resistant bacteria. Now, let's clear out what you already know. Resistant bacteria. Well, bacteria that are more resistant to cleaning procedures than others. Mycobacteria, for example. Mycolic acid protects mycobacteria from, say, chemical cleaning. Make sense? Fungal sexual spores. Special type of spores that fungi produce when they threaten. Let's put it this way. That's all you have to know by now. 
protozoan cysts. First, let's recall what protozoans are. Can anyone quickly formulate what is the protozoan? How many cells? One. Do they have a nucleus? Yes. Unlike bacteria, protozoans are single-celled eukaryotic organisms. Can you give me an example? Amoeba. Okay? Amoeba is soft. When you put protozoan in the environment that is unfriendly, such as dry, no nutrients, hot, whatever, many protozoans form cysts. They get rid of most of the cytoplasm and organelles leaving the nucleus surrounded by some kind of a capsule. Does that make sense? Cyst is not actively replicating, is not actively growing. It's a way to preserve the nucleus and the genetic information in that uh, rough environment. Does that make sense? But when environment becomes friendly, for instance, when you consume that cyst with the water and it gets into the tissues, after insistment, you now have normal growing protozoan cell. Do you see familiarity with something else that we talked about? The bacterial structure that endospore. It's not the same. Does that make sense? It's not the same. But it serves the same purpose, to preserve the organism through the harsh environment. So cysts are pretty resistant. We good? Now, naked viruses. The name comes not from the fact that they are filmed for the virus Playboy, but from the fact that they are made of the nucleic acid, surrounded by the protein capsid. Clear? Nucleic acid, such as RNA or DNA, surrounded by proteins. Examples of naked viruses would be adenovirus that causes respiratory and digestive diseases, rhinoviruses, <clears throat> the causative agent of common cold, hepatitis A or polio, they all are naked viruses. Okay. The last group consists of generally most of the bacteria regular fungal spores. I'm going to skip enveloped viruses for now. Yeasts, so single cell fungi, and protozoan trophozoites. Well, since they are not cysts, what do you think the term trophozoite means? Regular cell regular trophozoite cell that is capable of replicating. So like if you take amoebae, they would be like you look in the microscope and they swim and consume bacteria, that's trophozoites. Trophor means eating. Okay, eating and living microbes. Does that make sense? Okay. Enveloped viruses. So we can compare them to the naked ones. Nucleic acid surrounded by the capsid, but outside of that, you're going to have an envelope layer. Envelope consists mostly of phospholipids. Where else are we going to find phospholipids in the cell? Phospholipids, which part of the cell do they make up? membrane. So essentially envelope contains fragments of the cell membrane. Okay, and you will see how and the, the presence of envelope makes viruses more vulnerable to different chemical and physical methods of microbial control. You keeping up? Okay. You have to know that sequence. I will not ask you to put it down on paper same way that's in the that 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 
the sequences in the PowerPoint. But you absolutely may encounter the question, this is the right sequence in terms of sensitivity. Okay? Of course, I'm not going to put cysts, naked viruses, and sexual spore. So I'm not going to ask you, sorry, I just accidentally clicked it. I'm not going to ask you to compare things that are so close, but I may ask you, what is most sensitive of this three? Endospores, uh, naked viruses, enveloped viruses, protozoan, trophozoites, and you have to say endospores. Does that make sense? So you have to keep in mind these groups. Okay, you're not going to get all like three or four answers from the same group and then figure out what I mean. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand? Yes. The least sensitive is the most resistant, the hardest to endospores and preyons. Does that make sense? Good. Obviously, when you compare those guys, you have to compare them in terms of their resistance to a particular agent. Do you understand that? We can't say that this bacteria is more resistant than this one because it, it cannot be killed by the soap and that one can be killed by Clorox. So it's all in terms of one chemical. And when you take one specific chemical, the order may be slightly different, but this sequence represents the general idea, the general considerations, okay? So when you have, when, when you have to, to deal, to choose the sterilizing agent in a hospital, you have to keep in mind that endospores are notoriously hard to kill and you may get rid of all the vegetative cells but you're still going to get endospores. We good? Efficiency of the method. We can quantitatively measure it by measuring so-called decimal reduction time. On this graph, on the y-axis you see number of cells. On the x-axis it's time. The time that is required to reduce the number of cells tenfold is going to be decimal reduction time or devalue. It's five minutes on this graph. Okay, In five minutes the number of cells decreases tenfold. Right? Um, what can... So you have to appreciate the decimal reduction time is not in like an absolute final number. You change the concentration of the agent that's going to be changed. You change the concentration of of the microbe it's going to change. Okay, you start off with a higher load, maybe it's going to change. You compare biofilm to planktonic, it's going to change. Temperature, pH, all of that will influence. Does that make sense? Okay. Agents or methods can be sidal versus static. Microbicidal, sporicidal, virucidal, fungicidal, bacteriostatic, fungistatic. Sidal means killing, static means stopping microbes from growth. You see that here. Okay. This is the static agent. Microbes don't grow anymore, but when you remove the agent, they will start back again. Sidal agent will kill the microbes, reduce the number. Does that make sense? Okay. Now you also have to appreciate to which level you reduce the number of agents, the number of, of cells. When you choose the um, chemical to use or method or microbial control to use, you have to consider many things. Do you need to sterilize or disinfection is enough? What kind of agent are you dealing with? You see spores, much more resistant than vegetative cells. 
Okay, and even, and even in the case of vegetative cells, if you have a, a marketing, the bottle uh, of the, say, I don't know, Lysol that says kills 99.9% .9 bacteria. What if your initial load was 1 million? 99.9% .9 of 1 million is going to be, anyone? It's actually going to be 900. 99,000. So you still have a thousand cells left. And they're going to grow back. And in the blink of an eye, you're going to have the entire population there on the surface that you just cleaned up. Does that make sense? So it's kind of a lousy. It's it's great marketing trick, but it's a trick. Okay. Um, you have to... Hmm? Yeah, there's some, there's some, there's some stuff that's even better, but. Ask stairs. Let me give you the the expired ones. <laughs> I don't know. Um, do you need the item back? Okay. Syringes. That's why we make them disposable, because then we can apply really high heat to it and we have no temptation to use them back again okay um, so can it withstand heat can it withstand pressure can it withstand chemicals I mean if you need to sterilize food it's one protocol if you need to sterilize surgical instruments that's a com completely different story right surgical instruments are much more resistant to whatever you want to treat them with how expensive is that if you want to if you need to clean the floors that's one thing if spending a ton of money on spraying microquad all over the floor it's a little bit not effective on the other hand if you need to clean up the room then bleaching the entire room and wiping it off becomes labor intensive there are simpler ways that may seem more expensive but in fact they aren't in the long run. Does that make sense? So you have to consider all those factors. So what these chemicals target? They can target the wall, the membrane, and insides of the cell. In terms of the wall, some of them can inhibit the synthesis. Well, I mean, drugs can. The chemicals, in fact, simply break down the wall. When wall, bacterial cell wall or fungal cell wall is gone, What's going to happen to those fellows? They're going to die. They're going to lies, right? Bacteria, fungi, they're going to lies. That's why protozoan cells are so sensitive. They don't have a wall. They're not protected by the wall. So what can destroy the wall? Oxidative stuff, like hydrogen peroxide, heat. Membrane. Phospholipid bilayer that is effectively disrupted by detergents. You can see the uh, rendering of it, graphical rendering here. Surfactant binds to the uh, phospholipid molecules and essentially penetrates the membrane and changes its structure. When microbes lose the membrane, it alters the permeability of the cell envelope in bacteria or completely destroys protozoan cells or I removed the, my, the, the viruses. So if you have a virus in an envelope, in an envelope, you destroy envelope, virus is not infective anymore. In fact, enveloped viruses are not very stable themselves. If you have a sick child, okay, or you sick yourself, okay, say with influenza, influenza is enveloped virus. You have influenza. And you are concerned about the the infection coming from fomites, coming from the toys of a child or I don't know, remote control from the TV. Well child is easy because I can hardly imagine living without remote even one day. So toys, right? Parents would probably say, Oh, I'm gonna bleach them all. You don't have to. 
All you have to do is to hide the toys in the storage or in the garage, preferably at the room temperature, for three, four days. The virus will disassemble itself, so they're not really stable, those viruses. And they're really sensitive to cleaning agents. Now, denaturation of nucleic acid or proteins. When proteins are denatured, they can't perform the, the, the function, right? They cannot, they cannot function properly. Nucleic acid is denatured, no replication. Does that make sense? So it can be achieved. Heat, alcohol denatures proteins, phenols denature proteins, acids denature proteins. So we have quite a lot of options for treatment. Now we're going to uh, talk about physical methods and we're going to start talking about chemical ones. So physical methods of control. Temperature, radiation, and filtration. First, general considerations about temperature. High temperature is bactericidal. Boiling steam kills microbes. Low temperatures, like in the fridge or in the freezer, are bacteriostatic. They stop microbes from growing, not really killing them. Uh, and not even completely stopping them. So Hunter brought uh, the piece of pork, right, that is partially destroyed <laughs> by bacteria. <laughs> so, yeah, you can see that. Um, well, it's going to stink. It's okay, but we'll have to open it anyway. Yeah, so we have we have a huge bag over there. We have quite a lot of samples. Um, second, moist heat is more effective than dry heat. Okay, so this table gives you an excellent comparison. To sterilize using moist heat at a temperature of 121 Celsius. You need 15 minutes. Dry heat achieves the same goal in 10 hours. Quite a difference, right? Resistance and the spores are more resistant than pretty much everything else. Okay. Um, the higher the temperature the shorter the exposure that you have to do. Even with the dry heat, you see you uh, kick up the temperature from 129 Celsius to 170. 170 is something like 340... 3, 338 Fahrenheit. Okay? So, that's 338. And you reduce the time that you need for sterilization tenfold. That makes perfect sense. How can you characterize? What are the characteristics for each method? Thermal death time. Time that at the given temperature that's required to destroy all the microbes. So say for moist heat at 134 The thermal death time is three minutes. Does that make sense? Thermal death point is the lowest temperature that you can use to destroy all microbes in 10 minutes. So for moist heat, thermal death point is 125 degrees Celsius. Now let's talk about different methods. Autoclaving, pressurized steam. When you increase pressure, okay, when you boil water, what's the boiling temperature? 100 Celsius. What's the steam temperature that goes off the water? 100, yeah, 100. Now, can you increase it? Yes, by increasing pressure. 
So autoclave is like a big pressure cooker, okay? Pressure is 15 PSI. It is about one and a half atmospheric. Temperature is 121. It kills everything, endospores included. Highly effective. Tyndallization. John Tyndall, British physician, invented this method, well, before the invention of autoclave, works in a very interesting way. So uh, you put it in a, some sort of a steamer, turn up the heat, steam is formed. What happens to the vegetative cells, protozoans, and everything else? They dead. And the spores? Well, aren't. They functional. Not, you turn up, is they not so much living, right? I mean, they kind of living, but not very much living. You turn off the heat. Steam cools down. What happens to the steam? Condensates, right? Condensation. Water. What endospores do when there's water around? Germinate, right? It germinates. They, they become vegetative cells. So you wait for 24 hours for endospores germinate. You turn up the heat. You form steam again and you kill those vegetative cells. You turn it off, let it cool down, more endospores terminate. So with every cycle, endospores terminate, and you have less and less endospores, right? And every cycle you kill those freshly germinated vegetative cells. So usually three cycles are run. This method is not 100% reliable, because even after three cycles, you don't really know how many endospores are left, if all of them germinated or not. That's good. But you can use it if you don't have autoclave. <clears throat> Pasteurization. Different temperatures. So there are two protocols here. Flash method, 72 degrees, 15 seconds. It's an industrially used method, say, the milk producing facilities, like milk plants. They sterilize milk by running it through the heat exchangers. Um, my wife buys farmer's milk. I'm fine with Walmart. I'm okay. But she pasteurizes it. So you put it on the stove and heat it for 30 minutes, keeping it in the ballpark of 64, 65 degrees Celsius. She has a thermometer, so she knows. I mean, she buys farmers like the, like somebody milks the cows. It's like fresh milk from under the cow. I would, I would drink it. I would drink it. I would just take chances. Huh? I know, but they probably, they probably have different microbiota by the time. But I would take my chances. You know, what, uh, what, what's the worst thing that can happen to me? Shitting through? No, not from the milk. Shitting through the entire spring break. You know, that's we will see which microbes are destroyed by the pasteurization. There is a third protocol when you it's 138 degrees Celsius, two seconds. So it's extremely ultra high temperature, very short period of time. Uh, endospores survive. Their maduric microbes survive, but most microbial cells, and as you will see, the ones that cause diarrheal diseases are killed. Does that make sense? Um, sorry, I went totally blank. Oh, yes, yes, boiling. Sorry, boiling. Uh, not sterilizing. So out of these four methods of the moist heat, only one is 100% sterilizing, the autoclave. Boiling that you use when you have a, your first child and the pacifier falls on the floor, you immediately put it in the boiling water and both like 15 minutes. Huh? Um, no. Not really. It was shown. It doesn't work. Yeah, I understand. But I, I don't, I don't care. Let them eat dirt. Well, when I, when we had, when we just had kids, 
we boiled everything, you know, everything should be clean. Now, if that, if I would have wipe against my pants, so even not wiping at all. Sure, yeah, let her dirt. Uh, but it's good, it's disinfecting, it's good. Um, now, dry heat, incineration, burning. Extremely effective, extremely simple. Stick it in the flame. Okay, when we stick the wire loop in the flame, it kills everything. They physically burn. Okay, the main problem, obviously, you can't sterilize like plasticware so that it retains the functionality. But when I remove the splinter, okay, just take the needle, stick it in the flame, and I know it's sterile. I'll let it cool down a bit, so I'm, I'm safe. Desiccation is when you stick something in the dry oven. <coughs> it's not 100% reliable method. It can kill endospores, but it's not 100% reliable. So, since it's not 100% reliable, we can't say that it's um, sterilization. It's more of a disinfection. Infection. I became dyslexic. Okay. Does that make sense? So when you stick something in a dry oven, it dries things out. Right? I always have a temptation to force students to memorize the mechanicals of the autoclave. Just for fun. No, I'm kidding. I, I don't I don't know. I know how it works. You open the door, you stick your stuff in, you close the door, you click the button. That's how it works. Okay. Yeah, and when, when it's done, you open the door, get showered with a hot steam, like in the steam room, and that's it. And everything is clean. Seriously, when you have a room with three autoclaves and people from the entire department running it 24-7, that's, that's a treat. To get into that room, it's always hot and it's, yeah, it's a little colder, but fungus is everywhere because always, you know, steam, yeah, moisture is everywhere. Uh, that's actually some, some really fancy autoclave. We didn't have any sensor screen operated ones. It's all about you dial the amount of time, click the button and you go. Incinerator. You saw them. Pasteurization. So some milk are some milk is pasteurized 15 seconds, lower temperature. Others, uh, 138 degrees Celsius, two seconds. So what is killed? Let's see. Campylobacter jejuni. The most frequent cause of diarrheal disease in the U.S. Coxiella brunetti, causative agent of Q fever. It's a zoonotic disease that can, that can be transmitted from goats and cows and other farm animals. Um, listeria, you may have heard of listeriosis. It actually causes some mortality in the United States every year. It can cause very severe intestinal disease and What's worse, if it becomes systemic, it causes encephalitis. Absolutely, it's same listeria monocytogenes. Yeah, you shouldn't eat the... Um, honestly, don't eat anything then. Because listeria is commonly found on the packaged pre-washed greens that are sold uh, in, a, in a produce. Huh? The what? The bag salad. salad. Yeah, the bag salad. Although it is pre-washed, it generally they don't get rid of all the stereo there. Great question. FDA issued the uh, recommendation not to wash pre-washed greens at home 
uh, because there's statistically higher risk of cross-contamination from, from other kitchen products. Because usually, you know, you handle meat, poultry, and greens all in the same kitchen. So, generally speaking, people don't take care of the surfaces and utensils in the proper way. So there's a risk of contamination of greens from, say, utensils used to uh, take care of the pork chicken, raw chicken or turkey. So you can actually add something instead of removing something. Does that make sense? Because of improper handling of surfaces and tools. Um, e. coli O157H7, enterohemorrhagic strain. Um, Epidemics, the outbreaks were associated with bean sprouts recently. Well, they regularly are associated with bean sprouts. Causes hemolytic uremic syndrome and kidney failure, in addition to other funny things. Mycobacterium, tuberculosis and par tuberculosis. Tuberculosis can cause not only lung disease, but can also be extra pulmonary. So it can cause notorious uh, enterocolitis. Okay. Same goes for part tuberculosis. I don't think Salmonella needs any introduction. And Yersinia enterocolitica is the gram negative microbe that causes the intestinal disease. It is it's not an orphan disease, but it's often overlooked. So when patient has diarrhea, especially extended diarrhea, sort of chronic diarrhea. Yersinia, as the cause of diarrhea, is not in the, you know, on top of the list. And it's a zoonotic infection that often is transmitted from house pets, dogs, cats mostly. Okay. Well, desiccation, sucking the water out, high temperature, regular temperature, dry fruits, dry berries, jerky, that what preserves them for an extended time. Hmm? Everybody does. Did you take some from Barb, Barb and Putty uh, butcher shop, you know, and mentor? Barb and Patties? Well, it's even that is even better. Never heard. Um, radiation. Two types. Ionizing and non-ionizing. Ionizing radiation is highly penetrable, highly penetrating, highly penetrating. Gamma rays are the most penetrating, then x-rays, and then cathode rays. <clears throat> Nobody really uses cathode rays and x-rays in food treatment. It's all about gamma rays because they guarantee the sterilization. They break DNA strands, it cause double strand breaks, and even if it's an endospore, it cannot germinate anymore because DNA is damaged, right? Uh, another convenience of gamma rays is that you can use them on the batches, or you can use it at the conveyor belt. Say you can run this, I don't really know what it is, nectarines, apples, peaches, whatever it is, so, say, fruits, vegetables, on the facility that sorts them out and cleans them, you can run them through the um, gamma ray chamber with a, I think it is called a cannon, a source of gamma rays. So it radiates the food and reduces the spoilage. Make sense? So this is the sign that you can see on the food that's been treated with the radiation. In morning class, some people got freaked out when I mentioned about radiation treatment of foods. Is it going to induce any secondary? No. No. If you will be exposed to gamma ray, you're going to die, but you're not going to glow. Okay? Yes. No. No. It doesn't replicate. There's some people that not vaccinate their kids. Well, I know that, but like, is that like the same thing as this? Like, 
No, it's different. So uh, the microwave oven, you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Microwaves, they, uh, it's a certain range, certain certain part of the spectrum. Pretty much it's like a radio, but very powerful radio. Okay? So microwaves, when they interact with molecules of water, they make them move faster. Okay? And that's what heats the food. So that's why when you say, when that this fantastic meatballs, frozen meatballs, like bachelor's food, bachelor's chow, okay? So the, the kids' food, men's food, they, yeah, they should sell just men's food, just dumping. Uh, so, huh? Homemade, yes. We don't have time. So uh, you put them just on a plate and you freeze, uh, you thaw them takes slightly more time than if you cover them with a little bit of water. So water heats up faster. Better heat exchanger. Uh, have you seen, have you ever seen the, the, did you see the radar? Like any radar that works on airplanes and stuff. Like big, big antennas. They use microwaves. So if you accidentally put the person in the focal point of the radar, the person will explode. The water will boil inside. It's like a microwave, but not encapsulated. So, but there were cases like that. Yeah. So I heard a story of a guy in Canada, and he worked at like a satellite. Okay. And he was he used it to stay in during the winter, and he like he used it on Father's Day, and it killed him because there was so much excess of people calling their their fathers on Father's Day. It might be, yeah. So there were. I've heard story about the soldiers that were using the non-working antenna radar to take sun baths, huh? Back home, Soviet times. Yeah, so they they were taking sun baths, and then somebody turned it on. So one guy pretty much just died. Yeah, exploded because the water boils in all cells. Water starts to boil. Uh, so, you no, know, microwaves are fine. I mean, unless you put the cat in it. Well, even in this case, not for, it's not bad for you. It's bad for cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, that that's fine. And gum rays are fine unless you you stick yourself into the gum ray chamber. And it's great to treat foods. They use it to treat the medical devices like catheters, tubing that you shouldn't expose, you can't expose to the high temperatures. And you know, when you have mass production, you can actually package them and then treat them. That makes sense? Or consider people who are immunosuppressed. They can't eat regular food, you have to sterilize it. If you autoclave the burger, it's not going to be a burger anymore, trust me. So expose it to gamma rays. Looks, smells, everything is the same. It is more expensive, that's why we don't do it with the food in general. And handling radioactive isotopes that produce gamma rays is a bit of a hassle. Does that make sense? Non-ionizing radiation, you're going to see much more frequently. It's a UV light. It's less penetrating, much less penetrating, and it causes the time in dimers in the DNA. Okay, so it affects it, changes the structure of the DNA. It's not sterilizing, it is disinfecting. It doesn't kill endospores, but kills vegetative bacteria, fungal spores, and so on. You can see it in dental offices, in hospitals, in food treatment areas. Here, UV light is used in the biological safety hood to make sure that all potential pathogens that you worked with and any contaminants are destroyed. Of course it doesn't take care of the endospores, but at least it ensures that things are clean. You can also use it to treat the drinking water. Okay, One, by the way, one of the other modalities of treatment with UV light is that ultraviolet stimulates the production of ozone in the air. Ozone is extremely toxic, not only for humans, 
but also for microbes. The concentration of ozone in the air is low and doesn't hurt people, but it's enough, sufficient to reduce the microbial load. Now, speaking of the drink, treating, drinking water, what is the major cause of death in Africa? Well, diarrheal diseases, all of them together. And this problem stems from the lack of access to clean drinking water. Not malaria, not Ebola, not HIV, diarrhea. And lack of infrastructure, of course, is the main problem. So people take water from the wells, often open wells. How can you treat, what is the cheapest way to treat water to make it more pot portable? Maybe not as portable as the water that comes out of the faucet. Heat, well, iodine is expensive. Heat, can you boil it? Yes, you can. What do you need for boiling? Huh? Fire. Well, obviously electrical stove is not an option. So fire in Africa in the rural Africa. Where can it come from? Huh? Cow feces. Not so much. I mean, and they don't produce that much heat. Firewood. Huh? Firewood, right? Firewood. The problem is that you need firewood also to cook. And now imagine, have a, have a pot of boiling water at the outside temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And waiting for it to cool down it's it's just nobody's gonna boil it let's put it this way nobody's gonna boil it people have a choice between boiling and drinking it straight they will drink it straight so is there any other method to clean up the water it turns out take a plastic bottle paint half of the plastic bottle black pour water in it close it throw it out into the sun, leave it there, and just shaking it from time to time. It reduces the microbial load in the bottle. Huh? UV light is number one, it's number two. Heat, what's number three? Shaking. When you shake, they too small. What forms when you shake a, a, a liquid? Bubbles, oxygen. Oxygen in the bubbles will oxidize. So each of them individually will probably not be enough. But when they combine, they significantly reduce the bacterial and protozoan load in the water, making it way more potable. Does that make sense? Filtration. That movie that we saw about BSL-4, Lab, you saw the system of filters and it cost them a ton of money. Okay, now filtration <clears throat> allows you to handle large volumes of air, which is notoriously hard to sterilize, and fluids. Filter works at the very basic concept you have pores that are too small for microbial cells to penetrate through, right? And the smaller the pores, the better the filter. So the filtration system in BSL-4 takes care even of the viruses. The uh, filters that are used for liquids, usually not sterilizing because the viruses can pass through. But the uh, main problem, so when do we use those filters? For example, you make uh, an injectable solution and this solution during handling is definitely not sterile you have powder okay you may sterilize water but everything else is not entirely sterile chances to acquire viruses from the environment are very low unless somebody deliberately sneezes into the into the manufacturing process but bacteria are everywhere endospores are everywhere so that's why a lot of fluids, I, I used to work at the 
facility where they made in di different IV administered fluids. Last step at the moment of packaging is the filtration. Fluids are filtered. Of course, it's not an industrial scale example here. Uh, this shows you the pump, sterile bottle, and the filter. The filter has a, a very tiny openings, okay, very tiny pores. Pores with a diameter of 0.2 micrometers are considered to be antibacterial. 0.1 is antipyrogen. So they protect against fragments of the cell wall, lipopolysaccharide molecules that can cause elevated temperature in the patients. That makes sense? So filters can can be like industrial size, they can be lab size, or they can even be placed on top of the syringe. And you can pretty much inject directly through the filter. Okay. Air is handled through the high efficiency particulate air filters. Um, and they actually, well, things like burn units or BSL 3 and 4 facilities have HEPA filters. So burn units for the inlet air, BSL facilities for the outlet air. Does that make sense? Now, you have HEPA filters at home. Vacuum. Vacuums use HEPA filters. They're not as fancy as the ones that you saw in that movie. But they will still filter out fungi, fungal spores, uh, bacterial cells. So the air that comes out is pretty good. Okay. Now this uh, couple of pages summarizes for you. It's more of a reference for you. I am not so much concerned about examples, okay? I'm more concerned about for you being able to distinguish whether it's sterilizing or disinfecting. You see the difference? Like if I ask you, what of the following methods is sterilizing? Autoclave, boiling, or freezing. So tell me, autoclave. Does that make sense? That's what you have to focus on. Right? Now this, and if we didn't discuss something, don't have to be concerned about it. We discussed, we didn't, we didn't have a chance to talk about freezing actually. I missed the point completely, so I'm going to say a few words now. Cold doesn't kill microbes. Well, ah, we, we talked about it. Cold doesn't kill microbes. Cold is static. You think freezing will? Not really. You take the liquid culture, you freeze it, absolutely. Some microbes are going to die, but it's going to be, what, 70%, 30%, you will still, 80%, uh, you will still be able to recover them. It's not effective at all. So it's static. Okay? Um, desiccation. Talked about desiccation. Uh, reduction of war activity. Well, saltiness. Don't really get agitated about this. We didn't talk about lyophilization. I'm not going to ask anything. Just about lyophilization, don't worry, I just will tell you what it is. It's freeze dry. Um, yeast, baker's yeast that you have in the fridge, they lyophilized. So you take life culture, stick it in a special machine. What happens, it sucks out the water and it cools it down at the same time. So freeze dry. And then this lyophilized powder, it contains the cells that are not dead, but they can't replicate because there's not enough, there's no, no water around, but they're not dead. You put them in an <coughs> environment that contains um, humidity, 
water and they're gonna start start growing. Does that make sense? Um, radiation talks about it. Filtration. It's for your reference. So again, focus on disinfection versus sterilization. And you know, understand if I ask you how we sterilize food, don't suggest autoclave. Please. Okay. <coughs> Chemicals. That becomes more and more relevant to even your day to day experience. Currently, about a thousand different chemicals are used in the industrial and house settings for cleaning. If you would read the list of requirements here, huh? if you would read the list of requirements here, okay, it looks like a requirements for an ideal husband or ideal wife that do not exist, right? Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you know, you know. I will tell you. So no, well, okay. Let's let's go over it. So stable at ambient condition. In t it turns out, it turns out. Oh, you applying it? Okay. Um, no, it's okay. Uh, oh, you're good. Stable at ambient condition. Well, look. If something is not stable at ambient condition, you're not going to see it. It's going to disassemble, right? Um, either this or that. Either act rapidly or at low concentrations. Um, organic inactivation. When you clean up something, it's usually, you don't really spill the culture of bacteria. It's usually like bodily fluids, like blood. Blood contains a lot of organic material, and that organic material can inactivate chemicals. Uh, limited toxicity. Well, first of all, depends on how you use it, and second, depends on how effective the method is. Chlorine is extremely effective in killing microbes, and humans do. So if you want higher efficiency, there's going to be higher toxicity associated with that in general. Okay? Uh, broad spectrum, sidal, you prefer sidal, of course. High surface penetration. The surfaces, how do they look? How do they feel? Solid and smooth. They smooth, they're not porous. They smooth, so nothing gets into. Um, do you use cutting boards? Plastic or wood? Plastic? Plastic. Whoa, that's best. Glass is the best. Marble, marble, fantastic, marble, granite, anything that's not porous. You can use wood for things like bread. It's fine. Okay? Huh? Yeah, even in plastic. When you cut meat or poultry in plastic, you cut more and it has more nooks and crannies, right? How fancy. Um, but... This stuff gets gets into those nooks and crannies. But the good thing about the plastic, it doesn't get deep. It's still on the surface. So stick it in the washing machine, dishwasher. You run the cycle, high heat drying, it takes care. Okay? But wood, it'll absorb everything. Um, Non-corrosive, non-staining, well, good luck with that. Um, Sanitizing, deodorizing, pretty smell. Affordable, available. Depends on what you use it for. I mean, if you want to sell it to people in Walmart, it should be affordable. If you clean up surgical suites, affordability is much less an issue. Okay? So, what do you have to think about when you choose an agent? What are you treating? If you're dealing with spores, it's one thing. If you're dealing with viruses, it's a different thing. Um, what you treat. For instance, there's a, a compound, uh, the cleaning agent named Clydox. It's not um, 
for regular retail sale, you can order it for research in industrial institutions. It's pretty much like a Clorox, but it's really corrosive. We sprayed Clydex on, regularly sprayed Clydex on the, like a cart, metal cart. It got rusted in like two months well, because it's so corrosive. Um, how bad the contamination is. Time of exposure. If you can spray it and leave it, yes. Ninety-one percent. Maybe, maybe it's you can use it for extraction during I don't know when you cook. That that's my only. Isopropanol is toxic at pretty much any concentration. Ninety-one percent will kill you faster, but that's about it. Or the same dose. I don't know. Maybe it's about. Yeah. Well, 70% is going to kill you anyway. Well, yeah, but... But what? <laughs> Prefer the taste? Um, um, now, time of export Again, think about this. If you have contamination, like when, when I worked in BSL-3, we had an instruction. If you spill the agent, you cover it with paper towels, to avoid aerosolization and you spray the Clydex over it and leave it for 15 minutes. When you clean up the toilet, you cannot spray it and leave it for 15 minutes. You you got to you got to go if you janitor, you got to clean it up. So that's another point of consideration. And you know, the germicide, dogs, toxicity and stuff like that. I should use it. So that the table shows you different agents uh, how well they work, okay? Now, chlorine works at low concentration pretty effectively. Ethyl alcohol, 70% is used mostly. Turns out 96% alcohol conserves the microbes rather than destroys them. Uh, hydrogen peroxide acts really fast on all kinds of microbes. Um, Quaternary ammonia, things like, uh, uh, as far as I remember, pine salt, works slower. Ethylene oxide, you may seem that ethylene oxide is slow, but I will tell you about the advantages of gas compared to the liquid. It may seem counterintuitive, but in many cases, gas is much easier to handle than liquid sterilisms. The main take a message from that table is that different agents at different concentrations show different disinfecting properties and it depends on the microbe that they that they act upon. Does that make sense? Halogens, we're going to talk halogens and then uh, go for a break. Halogens Seventh main group of periodic system, fluorin, chlorine, bromine, iodine. I'm not talking about ASTAT, not interested. Fluorin, nobody uses fluorin. I mean, you're going to find it in the toothpaste, but it's not a pure gas, it's an ion. Fluorin is notoriously reactive and oxidative. You mix it with hydrogen, it's going to explode by itself, for example. No, fluorine, it's a gas, F2. It's a gas, but I mean, you mix it with hydrogen in the darkness, without light or temperature, it's going to explode. It's just horribly reactive. Huh? Uh, you want the electron structure? Uh, no. So it's pretty much the structure. It's the most uh, electronegative element among all. So it, it oxidizes everything. It oxidizes oxygen. So it, it's, it's bad. Chlorine um, kills microbes and humans, as Germans proved in 19, 
14, you know. Um, so the gas, since it's very toxic, is not used for sterilization. Instead, pretty much the solution of chlorine in water, when you use chlorine bleach, it's a solution of chlorine in water. When it is dissolved, it forms hypochlorite ion, hypochlorite, sorry, hypochloric acid, which dissociates into the hydroxyl radical and chlorine radical. Chlorine radical is fast, reactive, oxidative, so it, it takes care of microbes in a pretty good fashion. Okay, you can use it, things like chloramine, you can use it for the water disinfection. Here's the little task for you, by the way. Pools? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, pools are often chlorinated. You're a public health inspector. You go to the municipal pool and you take a sample of water. And you want to plate it to see if there's any growth. But in order to do it, and you don't know, maybe there's a ton of microbes, so they will form a lawn, and you want a quantitative result, okay? So you dilute it ten times, and you dilute it ten times again, and ten times more. And each dilution is plated. And the first original water doesn't give you any growth. Good. Right? Great. Second dilution doesn't give you any growth either. The third dilution, for some reason, start seeing a few colonies. And in the fourth dilution, the entire plate is covered with bacteria. How? Why? Yeah, because of less chlorine. So chlorine in pools is rather, it's more bacteriostatic than bactericidal. When it's present at the regular proper concentration, it prevents the bacterial growth. When you dilute the sample, you dilute the chlorine too. And bacteria now can grow. Does that make sense? You can, you can do this experiment. It, it's going to work like this. The more diluted the sample is, the more bacterial growth you're going to get. Up to a certain point, of course. Um, iodine. Have you seen iodine as the, the co simple compound? Just iodine, pure iodine. How does it look? No, 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 no. Not liquid. Not what you use in a hospital. Like iodine, chemically pure iodine. It's crystals. It's dark brown crystals. Um, very inconvenient to use as the disinfecting agent because it can cause chemical burns. So it's not dissolvable in water. But what you can do in all times, you can mix water with alcohol, add potassium iodide, and then in that mixture, iodine will, will be dissolved very easily. Now what we have, we have betadine, you have a polymer called polyvinyl pyrrolidon. You don't have to memorize the name, don't worry. That polymer absorbs iodine molecules, allowing you to create the solution which you then can use for antiseptic treatment of patient's skin. And it, it oxidizes bacteria, it kills them. That makes sense? Terrific. You may have noticed I skipped bromine. Have you ever seen bromine? Chemical. I saw it maybe a couple of times. It's liquid at the room temperature. It's boiling. Uh, so chlorine is the gas. Iodine is solid. Bromine is liquid. Brown, heavy, dense liquid at the room temperature with boiling point something around 30. So it gives off vapors. Bromine is aggressive, chemically aggressive, extremely toxic, strong respiratory irritant. Okay? It's really um, um, a horrible chemical. You have to work with it under the hood so it's not suitable. And when you 
you can't really make a water solution of bromine. That makes sense? So if you have iodine and different chlorine products, there's no point in even focusing on it. Okay? Let's take a break.